What are you are looking at here on my workbench is a Datum 9300 time code generator. I bet this is a piece of uh, test equipment most people have not seen before. So I'm quite excited to show it to you guys here and uh, later on as usual we will open it up and see what's inside. Now first thing first, this one is not a kind of uh, time code generators some of you might have used in some other places such as professional video industry where time code generators are often used to synchronize scenes and audios recorded on multiple tracks and devices and then synchronized together via this time code information in later processing. This one however is used to generate time code which contains the date and time information and distribute to the various connected devices that need synchronized time information. For instance in power generation and distribution industry and the rocket launch facilities where synchronous timing information among different components is critical. These time code generators often use the so-called IRIG time code standard. IRIG stands for Interrange Instrumentation Group, and the standard itself can be traced back to the 1960s. There are many variants to this standard, but uh, they all conform to a family of rate-scaled serial time codes. There is IRIG-A-B-D-E-G and dash H. They all differ in pulse rate ranging from 1 pulse per minute in the D standard to 10,000 pulses per second in the G standard. And the code used can be binary coded decimal BCD or straight binary seconds SBS. These codes themselves can be unmodulated, amplitude modulated, or use modified Manchester coding in situations where easy clock recovery is needed. So it can become rather complicated. For those who are interested, I would suggest that you taking a look at the IRIG serial timecode format document, which I will include a link in my, on my website. But as far as the waveform goes, it will look like something um, like this. And uh, of course, we will also see the actual output on the scope shortly. Now, before I open up this uh, unit and show you guys what's inside, let's first take a look at the, the general functionality of this timecode generator. And for that, I'm going to turn it on and we'll see what we got. So as you can see that we immediately see some of the numbers uh, displayed on this uh, unit and uh, here we have the three digits for days, two digits for hours, two digits for minutes and two digits for seconds. And right now be, uh, it's not uh, moving, the numbers are static because I put it on hold and so every time I power it on you will see uh, slightly different uh, numbers being initialized here and that's because uh, there's some uncertainties in the system and uh, the initial numbers really don't matter that much because uh, we can always uh, uh, adjust them later. So the idea here is once we uh, start triggering this, so I'll put the start, uh, put it on generate, put start, and you will see that the numbers started to increment uh, uh, second by second then the number will be translated in the IRIG format, which I described earlier, uh, to the uh, connected devices, and which we'll see the, waveform, the actual waveform in just a little bit. But uh, before I show you that, I also want to show you how this thing is uh, uh, adjusted here. So to adjust the initial uh, time codes information, we can actually use the rotary dial here in conjunction with these buttons to set initial numbers. So how it works is uh, like this. So basically we dial a number that we wish to set and in this case let's say uh, let's just do 2 for this number and we press a button we'll set it to 2. So this one's also 2 and uh, again if I dial this to 5 we can set this to 5. Now the hours we can also dial let's say 21, 2, and 1. So minutes let's dial to 22 and seconds let's do 33. So basically now we have set the uh, time codes that we wanted to transmit. Now everything is on hold because I have put the dial here uh, indicating that's in the hold position. So to uh, start triggering this uh, time code generator and to output the actual time codes, I can put it to the uh, generate uh, mode and press start. So 
Once I press start, you will see the second information start moving. And so now everything is uh, moving along. And this thing does have a little bit uh, smart built-in because you could potentially set hours to be outside the 24 hour uh, standard and minutes you can set it to six, seven, eight, let's say, even though every hour you only have 60 minutes. But in that case, uh, once it started counting, it will actually reset to zero and start, start from the beginning again. So that's how uh, this uh, uh, generator works. Let's put it back on hold. And now I just hooked up the time code generator's output to this oscilloscope. For the Statum 9300 uh, time code generator, we do have two output, and one is for the 1 kps and one is for the 10 kps. And right now we're connecting the uh, 10 kps, and I believe the actual signal output look pretty much identical except for the carrier frequency, one being 1 kilohertz and the other being 10 kilohertz. So if I turn it right on right now, we should see uh, this uh, uh, waveform start displaying. And indeed, we can see that uh, we have the uh, waveform changing here. So let's do a single shot on this and uh, we can take a look at the actual signal. So let's do a single shot. And uh, let me get rid of the manual here. So now as you can see, we can pretty much see what the signal looks like. And uh, there's some standard in terms of the modulation on the percentage of the zeros, for example, uh, in terms of the amplitude of the uh, carrier frequency and the ones. Um, and so this is actually exactly to the standard. If you recall what we saw earlier, we see that uh, the actual modulated signal looks something like this. And of course, there are other information uh, embedded in this. For example, which one's the start of the frame, which one's the end of the frame, uh, how to identify these. And these are something that uh, you can take a look at uh, the specification in detail. But here is what the waveform looks like. And uh, if, you, if I hit run here, you will see that uh, this will, uh, of course, right now it's a single shot. So every single time we capture slightly a different uh, waveform because the time information is uh, keep changing. So let, uh, let's uh, keep it free running. And um, let's just keep s change this back to auto. So of course now we have this uh, free running and uh, this is a time code sent uh, uh, through this cable. So if you have IRIG receivers that can interpret the time codes uh, you can then use the signal sent via this coax and synchronize to the clock information being sent. Of course, I'm not in the industry where this kind of time code generators are being used. I would love to hear from you if you know any instances how these devices are being used nowadays. If you do, please leave me a comment and I'm sure other viewers will appreciate this information as well. Also, due to the uh, proliferation of uh, internet, I have read somewhere that a lot of the uh, clock synchronizations are done these days using the uh, NTP network timing protocol instead of the IRIG code. Again, if you have more information on this, please let me know. Another thing I wanted to point out is that although this device serves as the uh, master clock for a facility of connected instruments, there's no requirement on its timing accuracy which makes sense because in this application, the critical point is that all connected devices are timed uh, synchronously to the master clock, whereas the offset to the actual time might not be as important. Some modern time code generators use rubidium standard or GPS disciplined oscillators as the timing source. I'm not sure what's inside of this unit, so um, it's something that we can take a look once we open it up. And I just open it up. As you can see here, everything is as expected, a discrete component. And uh, check out the circuit board here, and we can see that uh, uh, every single IC is uh, socketed, and they certainly spare no expenses here. And by scanning through the uh, boards, we can identify some of the components that we know. And most of the uh, components here, most of the ICs, uh, specifically are 74 series and for instance the ones towards the front here we can see that those are the DM9374 those are the seven segment decoders 
uh, for driving the LEDs here. And I did a quick look through and it appears that everything, all the chips here are 74 series. For example, this one right here is a 74LS08, which is a quad to input and gate. So um, everything is built up using the very basic components. Of course, we do have a few op amps here and these are the uh, uh, LM1458 do op amps uh, stuck right here. And here we can see the uh, crystal oscillator portion of the unit. And uh, as you can read here, this is a one megahertz crystal oscillator. And by the size of it, it appears that this is just a standard uh, oscillator. Or of course, it could be a temperature compensated one, but certainly not an ovenized one as uh, during the operation, it doesn't get uh, warm at all. So, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, ac actual accuracy of this unit is probably uh, doesn't matter as much uh, because the, the goal is to synchronize all the connected devices to the same uh, time standard, be it uh, uh, this particular oscillator or some more accurate oscillator. It uh, doesn't really matter. And because this time code generator generates a, a modulated signal, I would assume that there's some uh, analog circuitry besides these uh, digital ones. And I assume that is underneath this uh, piece of board. And I think I can just pull this out. Uh, hang on. Yep. And, oh, it's connected. Oh yeah, so this is actually serving as a ground plane so that it can shield the signal somewhat. And, uh, so underneath here, we can see a uh, 7405. I believe that's uh, some sort of uh, open collector uh, inverter, and not quite sure. And uh, then we have a couple of uh, op amps here. So these are the uh, 749s, two op amps. So those are used in conjunction with the remaining circuitry to modulate the signal for the output. And on this side of the circuit board, we can see similarly, we have a lot of the 74 series uh, TTL ICs. And uh, also we have some ceramic, uh, by the look of it, ceramic uh, packaging IC. And this specific one is a DG134. I actually couldn't find any information on this specific part number, but uh, just by the, uh, the, the prefix DG, it seems that it's a, a switch of uh, some sort. Not entirely sure. And I actually not sure what this big component is uh, right here. Also, we have some kind of uh, switches here. And by the silk screen here, it says a slew rate. So presumably, these are to adjust the uh, slew rate and the propagation delay. So because we have this uh, massive uh, board, so probably these things need to be fine-tuned um, for this to function correctly. One thing interesting I noticed is uh, while I was uh, looking at this is that some of the switches actually don't correspond to the front panel. For instance, this particular one. If you look at this, we only have two positions, uh, the wire soldered. And if I twist the knob here, I can only do it two positions. But on the front panel, you can see that we have um, indications for a uh, totally different set of functionality. So I assume that this probably, this unit, uh, was produced and uh, this depends on different options. You either have them or don't so they don't change the front panel And of course you can see that these indicator lights supposedly indicator lights or switches and we don't have anything hooked uh, behind And then here is our power supply section of the circuitry and later on we can do some measurements to see what the uh, output voltage is so now let's uh, flip this unit uh, uh, around and uh, take a look at the underside. Wow, check this out. This is actually constructed using the wire wrapping connections uh, between the different boards and all these connection points. So every single of those uh, dip socket, as you can see that these are made for wire wrapping uh, connections.
and uh, the board itself is actually uh, these two main boards are double-sided but apparently it's not enough to allow a proper routing of everything on the PCB traces so they have to do this kind of uh, uh, wire wrap connections among various points and uh, forgot to point out is that the vintage of this is a uh, probably somewhere late 1980s. So at that time I think we already had uh, multi-layer PCBs and presumably they could just done this using the inner routings uh, within from within a multi-layer PCB but instead they choose to use a wire wrapping to connect different uh, connections and I can just imagine how difficult it would be to for the post-production testings because if something goes wrong all these wires are the same color and you will have a really hard time of finding out exactly what is the problem you know if you miswired for example one pin and uh, that could really ruin your day but I have to say this is a really a uh, piece of uh, art and I certainly will post I'll take more high resolution pictures and post on my website and uh, you notice that even though this is a uh, wire wrapped but uh, the main uh, connectors here uh, especially to the front panel LCDs sorry not LCDs the LEDs uh, displays are actually uh, using this kind of uh, mounting mechanism so that uh, they can each individually be uh, taken out and serviced another thing caught my eye is uh, this power supply board here and by the look of it, we have it, this huge inductor here. So it appears to me that this is a switching power supply. So let me uh, take some measurement and uh, let's uh, see whether or not this is just a uh, filter toroid or it's actually a switching power supply. So now let's take a look at the uh, power supply portion. And we can see that uh, this unit has a, uh, a full bridge rectifier here and uh, the only thing I can see is that the transformer comes into that full bridge rectifier coming out through this uh, filter cap and feeds into the uh, power supply board. So let's first take a look at the measurement of the uh, input voltage and for that I need to be very careful because I don't want to short this out. I'm not sure which side is positive. It doesn't really matter. So let's uh, take a look carefully here. And this is at uh, 25 volts. So the input is 25 and the output here uh, is uh, through these connectors. So we can see that it has multiple voltages. So I'm assuming that uh, the black one is a uh, ground. So let's do that. And be careful not to short out anything here. So the ground is here. And now let's take a look at the green ones. Oops, the ground. The green ones are so this looks like our 5 volts power supply voltage. And then we have the red one here. This looks like it's a plus 15 volts. And uh, uh, the purple ones, uh, let me see if I can get this, is minus 15 volts. So it looks like, that makes perfect sense because the plus 5 volts are, uh, the, the, the plus 5 volts is for the uh, TTL circuitry. And the plus and minus 15 volts are for the uh, uh, op amps. That makes a lot of sense. So indeed uh, what we have here is a switch mode DC to DC converter converting the uh, single input 25 volts into three distinct voltages uh, plus 5, minus and plus 15 volts. So now we know that uh, this power supply board is a switched mode DC DC converter and uh, now let's take a look at this uh, power transistor's uh, drive waveform here and uh, just to figure out what's the uh, switching frequency here so for that i'm going to connect this to the ground and uh, the probe going to be probing the base of that uh, transistor here and as you can see we're triggering uh, on this waveform and it's not all that stable because this is a pulse with modulated signal here but nevertheless you can see that the switching frequency is at around 13.5 kilohertz and while we still have the oscilloscope out let's take a quick look at the output from the main oscillator here and as i mentioned earlier the 
oscillator might not be as accurate as uh, one'd like because this time code generator, the, uh, the goal is to synchronize all the clocks and uh, of course at the same time if the oscillator itself is uh, bang on that's all the better but uh, nevertheless it doesn't have to. And for this one it is just a standard uh, oscillator probably have some temperature control uh, built in but I'm not sure. So let's take a quick peek at what the waveform looks like. And of course we have to adjust it and uh, let's uh, expand the time base here. Uh, yeah, it's a little bit hard to get a clean uh, reading here so I have to just probe it. Uh, uh, hang on, okay here we go. So we are clocking in at uh, right uh, just uh, about under 1 megahertz and uh, so that's our uh, clock output signal. So that is pretty much everything inside this uh, time code generator and uh, although we have a lot of circuitry here and uh, as you can see the very complex wiring but the majority of the circuit actually doesn't really do that much. When you think about it all this TTL circuitry really is just to generate that uh, time codes and uh, which is obtained by the way from this uh, 1 megahertz oscillator. So the functionality there nowadays can be easily done within a single MCU like a say 80 mega 328. And uh, of course the modulation piece uh, can be done separately but uh, nevertheless it's uh, not that difficult. That's pretty much all I wanted to show you in this Datum 9300 timecode generator teardown video. I hope you enjoyed the video and learned something new. If there's something that I missed and you'd like me to discuss, please leave a comment below. As usual, if you find the video interesting, please give it a big thumbs up and remember to subscribe and share. I will catch up with you next time.